Even we heal as a team, we're going to crumble. Inch by inch, play by play, till we're finished. We're in hell right now, gentlemen, believe me. And we can stay here, get the shish kicked out of us, or we can fight our way back into the light. We can climb out of hell, out of hell, out of hell. One inch at a time. You know, when you get old in life, things get taken from. I mean, that's that's part of life. But you only learn that when you start losing stuff. You find out life's this game of inches. So is football. Because in either game, life or football, the margin for error is so small. I mean, one half a step too late or too early, and you don't quite make it. One half second too slow, too fast, you don't quite catch it. The inches we need are everywhere around us. They're in every break of the game, every minute, every second. On this team, we fight for that inch. On this team, we tear ourselves and everyone else around us to pieces for that inch. We claw our fingernails for that inch. Because we know when we add up all those inches, that's going to make the fucking difference between winning. It's the guy who's willing to die who's going to win that itch. And I know if I'm going to have any life anymore, it's because I'm still willing to fight and die for that itch. Because that's what living is. The six inches in front of your face. Now I can't make you do it. You got to look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now I think you're going to see a guy you're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it you're gonna do the same for him that's a team gentlemen and either we heal now as a team or we will die as individual 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 Welcome, everybody. Today's Friday, May 27th, 2011. I'm your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com, and this is Down the Rabbit Hole. Um, everybody that was listening Wednesday, I had uh, Jim Fetzer on, good friend of mine, fellow researcher, very, very knowledgeable human being, one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And uh, Jim was telling everybody uh, about Saddam Hussein's death and everything, and he was explaining uh, the very unknown, little-known story of what really transpired. And um, we were actually cut off by the, uh, you know, we don't, the fact that we only had during the week. I only get an hour. So um, before we go into anything else, I know Jim had wanted to add a few things to what he was talking about. So Jim, go right ahead. Popeye, it's a real pleasure to be back, especially. And so close to follow up on my previous discussion of the Mission Accomplished fiasco, I'll just remind your readers that if they want to see all the documents that substantiates what I've been reporting about the actual death of Saddam Hussein, which, which happened just uh, about three weeks after the invasion of Iraq, when a B-1 bomber pilot was given coordinates and instructions not to miss and he, he dropped a load of bombs on a restaurant on the outskirts of Baghdad and took out Saddam, his two sons, and about 60 members of his general staff. He was brought back. When he came back to base, he and the crew, they were lionized. They were put on CNN. He wound up being given the Distinguished Service Cross. There are lots of articles about it. Even Dick Cheney uh, was quoted as saying that Saddam's lifeless body had been pulled out of the rubble, and he was confident he was dead. You can find all that by going to 911scholars.org. Scroll down the homepage to the Mission Accomplished fiasco, and you'll see interviews I've done with the pilot's mother, Yvonne Wachter, talking about her son's experience. Now, what I did not add at the end, although I explained that he was feted at the Crystal Cathedral, for example, in Anaheim there in Orange County, which is one of the 
most glorious structures in Protestant uh, denominations where they televise all the services of uh, the Reverend Schiller, who has been the pastor there forever. He may have, in the meanwhile, been succeeded by his son. But the part I did an ad, the rest of the story is that Chris Walker was ordered to come back to, to Langley, where he was given a, a briefing and he was told by very high-ranking officials that they, uh, while they admired his bombing and the precision of his attack, that uh, they were sorry to report that Saddam had got away. And, of course, this was necessary to, to conceal the fact that they committed a blunder in doing this, the reason why they couldn't announce Saddam's death at the Mission Accomplished event on the USS Lincoln off the coast of San Diego is because George Bush would have thereby been announcing that he had violated three executive orders signed by Reagan, Ford, and Carter, who, which were prohibiting the assassination of foreign leaders, which, of course, would be precisely what he would have been announcing that he had just done. Yvonne and I have speculated in conjecture that it was in all probability Donald Rumsfeld who realized that they had to abort the mission accomplished event and could not announce what had been the intended prime feature of the entire occasion, namely that Saddam was dead. And of course, what they had to do, therefore, was perpetuate a charade. They had to find one of his doubles, have him allegedly discovered in a spider hole, taken away and eventually tried. And of course, some of you, if you were listening Wednesday, you remember I, I mentioned that the Red Cross put pressure on the uh, Allied forces to allow his wife to visit him. And when she discovered who it was, she came out screaming, this is not my husband. What have you done with my husband? This is not my husband. Which, of course, is perfectly appropriate considering that it wasn't her husband. So there you have, in a nutshell, the rest of the story. The whole thing was a charade. The whole trial was phony. It wasn't Saddam. I don't know if even the hanging was legitimate. It may be that they agreed with the double that if he would go along with the faking of the trial and pretend, you know, pose as Saddam, that when they hung him, there'd be a platform immediately under his feet. He wouldn't actually be killed so that they would give him, a, you know, a new identity and relocate him. But, you know, as these things go, it wouldn't surprise me if they'd struck such a deal and when the occasion came to uphold their end of it, there was no platform. He actually was hung, and that was the end of it. Then they don't have to worry about him resurfacing later somewhere in the world and causing political embarrassment. So I'm real pleased, Popeye, to have the chance to come back on and add those footnotes, those, that postscript to the story. So it, it's just amazing when you told me this story, Jim, and you told me, and I remember you, it got brought up, like I told people on Wednesday, this whole story got brought up uh, in the middle of our four-hour mega, you know, uh, radio thon we had uh, two weeks ago, and I didn't have a really big chance to touch on it. So that was one of the big reasons I wanted to give you, uh, you know, time today just to start off with to, to touch on the stuff that you weren't able to get out in the first broadcast. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure all the listeners right now are like, huh? Really? Oh, my God. Because I know, it's pretty stunning. And, of course, you know, as I explained then, I mean, uh, Saddam had these very expensive British-made Jaguar cell phones. And what he didn't contemplate was, of course, the British knew exactly how to intercept his conversation. So they actually had, you know, live, real-time transcriptions, you know, virtually instantaneous of Saddam's conversation with whomever. So they and they they also of course were equipped with GPS, so they were able to track his location using the cell phones. And in fact, he was on the phone when the attack occurred, and then uh, when the attack took place, the phones went dead, which of course was a rather strong indication that Saddam had also gone dead. And and, and that indeed appears to have been the end of it for him and his two sons. Where, as you mentioned uh, during one of our conversations, Popeye, there were later stories about the sons being killed, but those were also staged. I mean, look, after all, the military tells you they killed someone. Who here 
in your radio audience, for example, is in the position to contradict them. None of us. It's like this happy horseshit about uh, the second death of Osama bin Laden here, which Obama made so much of. We even know things were being faked at the time. He had this photograph of all of his staff, including the vice president, Hillary Clinton, Obama, looking intently at a television screen. It was broadcast and announced, and I could send you articles that show it was supposed to be live, but it was all fake. No, you could tell it was it was a psyop from the get go. And we even uh, we did a video. We mentioned uh, your Facebook rant on it. All right, we're going to break. Stay tuned, guys. You don't want to miss the rest of the hour with me and Jim Fetzer. Micro 1650 AM, the Orion Talk Radio Network. Real patriots stand up and say, 9 11 was an inside job. They lie, they scam, they cheat, and steal. They plot, they fun, they act, it's real. They watch, they hunt, they punish, and kill. We're not gonna take it. Hell, we ain't gonna take it. That's right, we're not going to take it. And that's why Jim Fetzer is here with me tonight, educating you people. And he's got some inside information about how disinformation is put together and the mainstream media, with, you know, using the mainstream media and how they, they try to make you look like a, a, a nut and everything else. Uh, Jim, when we were at break, you were telling me that you're actually getting interviewed by, or you got interviewed by the BBC recently. Well, it was uh, the second time they came here to my home. This time they interviewed me for four hours, uh, previously a couple of years ago for eight. And when they did that eight-hour eight gig a couple of years ago, it was for a BBC Conspiracy Files program on 9-11, where they featured me, uh, Alex Jones, and uh, Dylan Avery. And uh, uh, of my eight hours, and I gave them wonderful stuff, they uh, selected about one argument of mine that they thought was the most uh, far out and put in seven and a half minutes of me, four minutes of uh, Alex, and three and a half minutes of Dylan Avery. So you had 15 minutes of the show was devoted to these representatives of the 9-11 movement. And, I, and the other 45 minutes was devoted to some psychobabble about why anyone would be disposed to believe weird things like this. In other words, it wasn't a question of our explaining the evidence and the reasoning that supported the conclusion that 9-11 was an inside job. Instead, they cast Dylan Avery as a, the snot-nosed kid. Alex was the messianic preacher, and I was the kooky professor. I mean, there's no doubt about it. So when I saw that, you know, how they had put it together, given all the great stuff I had provided during that eight hours. Was there like a script or something that you saw that you were able to no, see? No, all this not that I, had, or? I, was, I was unaware of it, but I think they had a script when they set out. But it's amazing, you know, what they were going to do, that they were just looking for something. Uh, I talked about so many things on that occasion, you know, all about New York, all about the Pentagon, all about uh, Shanksville. I mean, I went into... Argument after argument after argument. I don't know. I must have given out 40 arguments anyway. More, probably. And, in fact, what they did was, at one point, and they, had, they were shooting me in different locations. I have this finished basement, and one half is uh, we have some exercise equipment, my son's air hockey game, a wet bar, a nice table, and all that sort of thing. And the other side is my library, what I have remaining, which is about 10% of what I had when I was a professor because I just didn't have room for all my books. And then I have this uh, study off of the library where I am now, where I do my shows and I have my 9-11 books and all that sort of thing. And then there's a hallway and a half bath and then storage area in the back. And they shot me in different positions here in my library and so forth and then brought me over to the table there by the wet bar and got in, kept asking me this question over and over. It was about the Pentagon because I was explaining that the after... The civilian, the, the plane they had allegedly hit, the civilian lime green fire trucks had shown up. That there's a wonderful photograph showing them extinguishing the very modest fires. And the lawn is very visible, very clean. There's no, you know, it's as smooth as a putting surface. Well, that's why they brought in dump truck loads of dirt, Jim, and then ended up covering up the evidence. 
Well, that was at a later stage. Yeah, I agree with that, too. That was a part of it. Well, they didn't want you to see the clean lawn. They didn't want you to see that there was no plane debris and that there was no. I mean, you look at the pictures, the, the first couple pictures before the collapse of the Pentagon. You can see the hole is maybe 16 feet wide. How are you supposed to fit a 150 foot wide airplane in a 16 foot hole? Right, 125 foot wingspan. Yeah, tail 44 feet high. There you go. Yeah, feet. I was, I was, I, I, yeah. I, I was off by 25 feet. But now, still, now, now, even that, now. how you put 125 feet in a 16 foot hole? Yeah, and there's no massive pile of aluminum debris. <laughs> yeah. There's no wings. There's no tail. There's no seats, bodies, luggage. And not even the engines, which are virtually indestructible, were recovered. So if anyone wants to see the photograph I'm talking about, they should do a Google, do a search on what didn't happen at the Pentagon. And they'll see this photograph from a distant back across this beautiful lawn of the lime green fire trucks extinguishing his modest fires. Now, what happens is later on, a whole host of debris starts showing up. So we have, a, you know, there's a photograph of this one piece of fuselage, for example, that's from a 757, and it's even been photographed in several different locations as though that were to multiply the amount of evidence there is. But it's certainly the most conspicuous piece of fuselage. Only, uh, Popeye, it doesn't show any singe marks. It doesn't show any signs of having been burned. And yet, you know, in these five initial frames of the Pentagon release, you have four of them are these gigantic fireballs. And if that plane had actually been in that uh, gigantic fireballs, it would have been severely toasted. And this piece of fuselage isn't. It's just pristine. And there's actually, in a corner of it, there's a chunk of vine attached to it. Now, a chunk of vine didn't come from hitting the Pentagon. In fact, a very astute student of 9-11 by the name of James Hansen, who's an attorney from Columbus, Missouri, actually studied the possible sources, and by a process of elimination, discovered there was really only one crash that could explain this piece of fuselage with this chunk of vine attached to it, which was one that occurred in Cali, Columbia, back in 1995. So that we have, you know, a, a history actually on this piece of fuselage. It's something they had in storage, and they got on the lawn. But the question becomes, well, how was that done? Because they couldn't have enlisted men and officers coming out there with pieces of debris in their hands. So I was explaining to the BBC that it appeared to me the way it had been done was that there was a C-130, you know, a cargo plane that was circling the Pentagon. And that my best guess was that the cargo plane had been used to dump this debris out on the lawn. Because then it just comes floating down, Pop I see. And, and if you're not there at the time, you know, or if you hadn't been there originally, you may think, well, maybe this is remnants from the crash, the crash that didn't happen. And didn't so you say prepared. that all the cops that 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 you, I remember we were talking about the interview that was done and you said that all the cops that had worked at the Pentagon that saw and testified on this video, I think there's four of them and said that they had seen the plane coming from a different direction over the naval annex and everything else. And then they, they reported this kind of strange anomalies. Didn't they get reprimanded for appearing in that video, you said? Well, I'm not sure. What I brought up was National Security Alert, which is a documentary made by the, the uh, Citizens Investigative Team, who discovered a, a group of witnesses, and I think they have nine or ten, who were able to testify, bear witness to seeing a plane approach the Pentagon, but it was coming in north of the Sitgo station. See, what these guys realized was there was a, a, a significant geographical feature that differentiated the official account where you got this plane flying at 500 miles an hour, just barely skimming the ground, taking out lampposts and impacting with the Pentagon on a very acute northeasterly trajectory. But it, that would have had to have been had it occurred south of the Sitco station. On the other hand, you have uh, flight uh, data recorder data that was obtained by pilots for 9-11 Truth from the federal, the, the federal National Transportation Safety Board that it claimed came from Flight 77. And when pilots analyzed the data, they discovered this plane was on an easterly trajectory, that it was north of the Sitco station, that it was 300 feet in the air, too high to hit any lampposts, and that when it was one second from what would have been impact with the building, that it was still 100 feet too high, which corresponds with a report from uh, a trucker buddy of a friend of mine from JFK Research, whose name is Roy Schaefer. His buddy is named Dave Ball. And he was in a truck right in front of the Pentagon. And he wrote to Roy and told him 
they'd seen this big plane fly toward the Pentagon and then swerve over it. And Roy wrote to me to tell me what Dave had seen and reported and explained that he was puzzled because Dave claimed the plane had hit the Pentagon even though he hadn't seen it happen. Amazing. Everything, you know, 9-11, it, the things that happened on that day, uh, we could do a, a six-hour broadcast just on, on that alone. It's incredible. Guys, stick around. Jim and I are going to break. We'll be back in about three minutes. we got to go pay some bills. Stay tuned. Welcome back. It's Friday, May 27th, 2011. This is Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com. Go check my website out. It's a plethora of information. It's a virtual archive of any, you know, everything that I, I deem that's important. And I'm not saying that I have everything that's important up there, but it's, it's an archive of uh, tons of articles. <laughs> Some of the websites that those articles have come from are now gone. That's why the, our website exists, so that if these people can't afford to pay for their website anymore or somehow they get taken down by the YouTube or, or Internet you know, police, uh, we, that's why I, I, I constantly take videos. That's why we have the website. You know, we're, we're like an aggregator. We, we try to keep the knowledge available for everybody, and it's all for free. So go check it out, federaljack.com. All right, guys, before we went to break, Jim Fetzer was enlightening your minds. So, Jim, go right ahead. So uh, this friend of mine, Roy Schaefer from JFK Research, had this trucker buddy, Dave Ball, who was right in front of the Pentagon, who actually saw the plane fly toward and swerve over the building. So that was pretty important, and I thought I'd like to get him on the show. So I contacted Roy and asked him if he could put me in touch with Dave, and he told me later that Dave was worried about doing it and thought he was better to keep his mouth shut. And I... I tried to explain to to Roy how that's exactly the wrong attitude to take because once you get your story out there, there's really no reason to take you out uh, because it would only raise more questions, you know, invite attention. So unless there's some really good reason. Yeah, well, it's like when people ask me how come – like they say, well, how come Alex Jones hasn't been killed? Well, because if they kill him – they instantly verify everything he said, even if he was lying about everything he said. Okay, it doesn't matter. You kill him. You take him out. You have now just made him a martyr, and a martyr is way stronger than somebody on the microphone speaking out, and they know that, so they won't do that. So you're right, Popeye. So, so Dave declined to do it, and, uh, and a couple months later he was found dead in an abandoned building. So I was pretty disappointed about that, but I was explaining all this to the BBC, and when I got to the point of trying to account, you know, for how the debris showed up on the lawn and told them my best guess was that it had been, been dumped by the C-130, they got their camera about two inches from my, my forehead and started asking me repeatedly about the C-130. And I think they were expecting, you know, each time they asked it, I had to answer it again, that I was getting a little more intense. So that was the segment they used for their, they had eight hours of me, perfectly calm, relaxed, just expounding one argument after another about how we know 9-11 was an inside job. And out of that eight hours, they picked this about 90 second piece that was out of context. So it sound pretty weird if you just have me saying that I think that the debris was dumped out of a C-130. I mean, if you don't know that the lawn was perfectly clear and clean and immaculate and pristine after the crash had occurred, after the lime green fire trucks had been there putting it out, you know, you wouldn't realize there's a question about where the debris ha ha had come from. And, and this is where, so far as I can see, this has to be the explanation. Okay, so they'd done that, and they'd spent 45 minutes using some psycho babble about why Dylan and Alex and I held these bizarre beliefs, you know, as though they couldn't be justified by logic and evidence. So when I was contacted again, this is about two months ago, <coughs> by the BBC, I got a hold of the guy named uh, Michael Rudin, R-U-D-I-N, at the BBC, and I told him, look, here's what happened last time. I said, now, if you're interested in getting the truth of 9-11, I said, <coughs> I'd like to cooperate. <coughs> and he said he'd get back to me. And he, he would eventually get back to me and put me in contact with his assistant, a fellow named uh, James Woldridge. James Woldridge. 
And I sent James a host of links, you know, in about 20 articles and studies. <coughs> now, <clears throat> James even called me and we had a conversation, though I must admit it was rather one-sided because, you know, I should have been picking his brain to see how carefully he'd read my stuff, and instead I was giving him an overview summary of the whole thing. In any case, <coughs> we went forward and arranged for them to come here last Tuesday. That's just a couple of days ago. <coughs> and they spent four hours down here in my library, you know, having me do a little intro to the library in my study where I do my show and all that sort of thing, and interview me for four hours. Now, the interview was pretty good. The only one thing that the guy, this Michael Rudin, did that kind of uh, surprised me a little was we were deep in the context of talking about Shanksville. And I was explaining how there was no evidence that any plane had actually crashed there, as the two reporters on the scene at the time had said. That the weird thing about this crash site is there's no indication that any plane had actually crashed there. And I was talking about the official story that the plane disappeared because it was crashing into soft ground, and one variant of it has that the plane actually disappeared into an abandoned mine shaft. And that we know what to do with miners who are trapped in abandoned in mine shafts. We get out the bright lights, have equipment, and we dig 24/7 in the hope that desperate hope that by some stroke of fortune someone may have survived. But we did not do that. So here you had a plane that had. Let me see how many passengers were supposed to be on that plane. Forty-five passengers were supposed to be on United 93. And they didn't get out the bright lights. They didn't get out the heavy equipment. They didn't dig 24-7, which tells you something. Not only was there no indication of any plane being there, they didn't act as though there actually were a plane there. They did some tidying up of the ground. They kept photographers and reporters a thousand yards away. And when they were all done, they trimmed the trees and the brush that had been singed. And I'm sure the reason was so it couldn't be subjected to a chemical analysis that would have shown the fires were not caused by jet fuel. So as we were going out, you know, I was thinking about how they were going to play this thing. And I asked him who else they were interviewing, and I'd already known that Alex was also going to be on this list. And he also mentioned they were going back to New York, and they were going to you know, interview a couple people there. And I'm sure these are going to be, you know, members of families of, of loved ones who died in the because he was trying to you know provoke me by saying well aren't is this being disrespectful you know to those who died on 9 11 and i said on the contrary that we regard it as the highest form of respect to determine how and why those three thousand of our fellow citizens died which the government obviously has not done so they're going to go back to get this emotional tug. And, of course, he can pick and choose what parts he uses. And he told me they were also going to wind up in San Francisco. And they were going to interview somebody who uh, who thinks there was a design flaw in the Twin Towers. And I told him, I said, well, you know, that's not true, I said. These were two of the best design buildings, uh, you know, ever conceived by the mind of man. And that they had won many awards. But I'm sure that, you know, that was just an aside I made to him. I mean, it's just blatantly false. But it did set me off on thinking about who this person might be, because I've had encounters with a guy who's an engineer. No, he's actually an architect who claims to work for the firm that was involved in, in some aspect of the construction of the towers. And he advances some open office space collapse theory. Now, anyone who looks at photographs of what actually happened on 9 11, one place to go would be new 9-11 photos released on my blog at jamesfetzer.blogspot.com. You can just do a search on new 9-11 photos released and you'll find it. And what we're seeing is, you know, the destruction of these two buildings from the top down. And they're being, you know, parts of them are being blown off at great distances, which requires enormous energy and could not, would not have happened had any form of collapse occurred. Plus, there was no reason to, no cause that could have initiated a collapse. The fires didn't burn hot enough or long enough to cause the steel to weaken, much less melt. Not only that, but if you assume, contrary to the facts, that the fires had burned hot enough and long enough, then since the fires were asymmetrically distributed, you would have had some asymmetrical sagging and tilting. That's all that would have occurred. There would not have been any abrupt, total, and complete demolition, which actually is what occurred which involved the conversion of those buildings into millions of cubic yards of very fine dust. I mean, all this required a huge amount of energy. We're still trying to figure out how it was done. 
But the fact of the matter is they had to use some novel form of demolition on the Twin Towers in order to preserve the bathtub, which was this enormous dike or moat in which the two buildings were erected to keep Hudson River water out. If the bathtub had shattered and any substantial portion of the, either of these 500,000 ton buildings would have done that, then Hudson River water would have flooded beneath lower Manhattan, all the subway tunnels and the path train tunnels across the, the river to New Jersey. It would have been a horrible mess. In fact, I had Father Frank Morales, an Episcopal priest who was a first responder on the show with me twice, and he told me how... Hang on, Jim. Hold that thought right there. Guys, we're going to commercial break. We'll be back in a few minutes. We're going to pay the bills. You're listening to Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Popeye, from federaljack.com, and today I've got with me Jim Fetzer. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. To be free, till you die a slave, a soldier in the desert, searching for a ghost in the cave for the corporation. I run out of patience, sick of seeing troops sink to die for your lives. Spending dollars in debt, we holler in protest till we have your arrest. We will not rest, and we know, we know, we know what you did that day. Kill your own citizens to advance. Welcome back, guys. It's the final segment. Friday, May 27th, 2011. I have with me my guest, Jim Fetzer, and before we went to break, Jim was discussing something. So, Jim, go ahead and pick right up where you left off. Thanks, Popeye. So I had Father Frank Morales, who was an Episcopal priest from St. Mark's, immediately in the vicinity. On He was a first responder, and he explained on two different interviews how the buildings had been destroyed below ground level. Now, that's quite stunning, Popeye, and, and, and it kills any theory that there was a collapse, because we know from the demolition of buildings of many different sizes that when you conduct a demolition or involving a collapse you got a stack of pancakes or floors or rubble that's approximately equal to 12 percent of the original building that happened with building seven which was a classic controlled demolition it was 47 stories and you had about five stories five and a half and debris floors pancakes with but with the twin towers they were destroyed below ground level which shows it cannot have been a collapse and indeed while uh, the BBC was here, I explained that the whole idea of a collapse was ridiculous if you understood the design of the building because the steel in the sub-basement was six inches thick and then it got five, four, three, two, one and tapered off to like a half or a quarter inch thick at the top, which means if you take the North Tower as an example, when a plane hit on the, about the 96th floor, if you take the top 14 floors and evaluate the mass of the steel of that top 14 floors re in relation to the other 96, that top 14 floors only represents 1.4 of the mass of the steel, which the rest of the building represents 98.6. There's no way 1.4% of steel is going to overcome the 98.6. I, I also gave this simple analogy. I said, well, suppose you had a stack of silver dollars that were welded together, and on top of that stack of 50 cent pieces that were welded together, and on top of that stack of quarters that were welded together, and you dropped a couple of dimes on it, would you, would you think they were going to collapse? Because that's the way it was. Now, it just so happens that there's a guy, this architect by the name of Jeffrey Orling, who wants to promote this internal trust collapse theory. It's an absurd theory. Uh, it requires that everything be exactly symmetrically balanced, that somehow these floors came uh, came apart and one fell on another. It's not even consistent with the uh, timeline studies that Judy Wood has done, where she observed that if you had a near, near simultaneous collapse, one floor on another, one floor on another, one floor on another, that, that for the building 110 stories, it would take about 97 seconds. Well, they, they, even NIST said this all happened in about 10 seconds, nine for the south, 11 for the north tower. So it's not even consistent with the timeline that there be a collapse. I've also explained physically it would have been impossible that there should be a collapse. That you have this tiny mass, 1.4, overcoming 98.6. And then I gave a little analogy of the, the silver dollars, the half dollars, the quarters, you know, all welded together. And then having a couple dimes dropped on them as though that was going to cause a collapse. So what, here's what I think they're going to do. They're going to find members who ostensibly are in the 9-11 truth community. They're going to get this Jeffrey Orling to claim there was a design failure and the buildings collapsed. I've already explained to them how it's not even physically possible that that should have happened. I've had extensive dealings with Jeffrey Orling's on the Deep Politics Forum. I've refuted his argument dozens and dozens of times, but he's like the Energizer bunny. He keeps coming back and back and back. 
which, by the way, is one sign that you're dealing with uh, someone who is not committed to truth. Okay, so you have Jeffrey Orley to claim actually he's an architect. See, I'm not an architect. Hey, I'm a, I'm a philosopher. Actually, I have my PhD in the history and the philosophy of science. They won't mention that I founded scholars and brought all these experts together and that I've been discussing this with physicists and engineers and all that for all these years. They'll just say, here, you got an architect who says the buildings collapsed. You got Fetzer over here who says it was impossible. Who are you going to believe? Then they're going to get somebody who, was, who claims that a plane hit at the Pentagon. Well, curiously enough, there's a guy who was early on in the 9-11 truth movement named Jim Hoffman who's insisted for years and years and years that we should, the 9-11 movement should not argue about the plane at the Pentagon because he claims the Pentagon could turn around and produce a video that actually shows a plane hitting there. Well, I say, given the physical evidence, that's completely absurd. And that Hoffman is promoting this is very dubious because it seems to me that the fact that there no plane hit at the Pentagon and that they used a series of enormous dumpsters, by the way, to produce billowing black smoke so that when the co Congress heard the rumor that the Capitol might be on the target list and rushed out onto the steps. They looked at, across the Potomac and saw this billowing black smoke, which wasn't coming from the building itself, the Pentagon. It was actually coming from a series of enormous dumpsters. So they were actually watching a Hollywood-style special effect. Well, this kind of stuff is extremely powerful and convincing that what we're dealing with here was a staged event faked by the American government. So they'll get Jim Hoffman on there to say, well, Fetzer claims it's impossible, but, but Hoffman says that, in fact, the plane actually hit there. And then <clears throat> what else are they going to appeal to? They're, they're, they're going to have, uh, they'll have, uh, oh, yeah, Alex Jones himself doesn't want to talk about the possibility of video fakery or, uh, in New York. We have the one video that everyone has seen of Flight 175 hitting the South Tower. It turns out when you study that video, and it took me years to open my mind to this Popeye, the plane is traveling at 560 miles an hour, which actually is a cruising speed of a Boeing 767, but at 35,000 feet. At 700 to 1,000 feet, its altitude, when it allegedly hit the South Tower, the air is three times denser, and it couldn't possibly suck the air through the turbines fast enough to make that speed. In fact, Pilots for 9-11 Truth has not only confirmed that the plane is traveling at an impossible speed, but in a new documentary it's just produced called 9-11 Intercepted, it explains that at such a speed a plane would be unnavigable. You couldn't fly it, you couldn't manage it, and it would start falling apart. So this whole idea that this is a legitimate video is ridiculous. It's showing an impos aerodynamically impossible event. It shows it entering into the building, just disappearing into the building. There's no collision, no impact. You can't even see the, the damage that would show up later that it allegedly done to the building. There's some wonderful videos about this out there if you go onto YouTube. Just look for, uh, let's see, one's called something like um, uh, the cartoon video, you know, cartoon flight 175 cartoon video, something like that, you'll find it. It's just stunning. So are they going to use Alex against me when I point out, you know, these impossible features? In fact, it's also the case that if you study the number of frames it takes for the plane to pass through its own length into the building, it's the same number of frames it takes for the plane to pass through its own length in air, which would be physically possible only if this 500,000-ton building provide no more resistance to the plane's trajectory than air. So we're seeing impossible events in the video, which means that we're not looking at authentic events because no authentic event is an impossible event. So it's not that tough. Well, what they're going to do, I think, is to pit Jim Hoffman, Jeffrey Orling, and Alex against me on different issues here and suggest, you know, who knows who's right and that there's no coherence in the movement because we disagree on these major issues. That's my best guess, Popeye, is what's going on here. Yeah, so they're going to try to make it look like all you guys are infighting and everything amongst each other when, I mean, in reality, just because one researcher doesn't say, oh, you know, doesn't agree with another researcher's, you know, theory. Look, at this point, everything is theory until we could actually get the evidence that we're supposed that we've asked for. We, well, until me, we can get yeah. access to certain things. The well, only thing is. Our theories are more plausible because we have the evidence to back them up, whereas their theory of 19 dudes in a cave with box cutters and a laptop is just laughable. It doesn't well, stand I, up to any of the evidence. 
Popeye, you're right about that, that, uh, you know, presumably all three of us or four of us would agree that the official count is unsustainable, but the BBC won't even mention that. The, the BBC is going to try, I think, to pit me and Alex against one another about planes or no planes in, the, in New York, and he'll just say, oh, it's crazy for anyone to think that the videos were fake. And yet it's provable. Pilots has confirmed it, that it was traveling at an impossible speed, made an impossible entry, which happens to be in violation of Newton's laws. It, it can't possibly have entered the building in the same number of frames that passed through its own length in air. So, I mean, I'm right about that. Pilots is right about that. We can't be wrong because we're talking about violations of the laws of aerodynamics and of physics, which, which can't happen. Then they're going to pit this Jim Hoffman about the plane at the Pentagon. Well, I've enumerated all the evidence. Just take a look. No plane crashed there. So if Hoffman wants to argue a plane did crash there, he, he hasn't got any evidence on his side, but he's going to claim it, and they're just going to show that I say it didn't, and he says it did. They're not going to address the evidence. Yeah, because of course, the, the burden of proof is actually on him to provide evidence that sh for a plane crash because even the well, eyewitnesses there said there's no – I mean even the early reporters, now they've gotten the reporter to go back years later and obviously recant his statement because except, you know, he was obviously except, told by his higher-ups. But he said live on TV because I saw the video. He said, look, there's no evidence that a plane even crashed at the Pentagon. There's no you're talking wreckage. about Jamie, Jamie McIntyre, the CNN reporter, for early on the scene said, yeah. Yep. There's no indication that any big any plane crashed here. Uh, there's no large parts, no nothing like that, no tail, no wings, etc. Yeah, he absolutely said that. I but remember, Popeye, these guys aren't going after the truth. They're going after the most superficial impressions they could create. And, of course, with Jeffrey Orling, remember, I've already demonstrated the towers cannot possibly have collapsed. And the fact is, having spent 35 years teaching logic, critical thinking, and scientific reasoning, I know what I'm talking about, but the BBC is going to give a superficial presentation and imply that we're inconsistent and, and no one knows who's right and who's wrong. That's just typical, typical stuff, Jim. And anyway, par for the course. These guys are going to try to de see. It's like almost like Cass Sunstein, you know, get into the truth movement, take it apart, yeah. you know, yeah. get people in fighting. And that, they're doing the this for the tenth, Popeye. They're doing this because the tenth observance of 9/11 uh, is yeah, about this year's the tenth, tenth anniversary. BBC, of BBC conspiracy files. Check it out. See if I'm right. See if I'm wrong. I'm willing to bet that you're going to be right, Jim. Well, thank, thanks a lot for coming on. It's been a great...